Hi, welcome to our session today, Enhanced Network Evidence for the Modern SOC. My name is Amanda Lemmers, and I'm excited to introduce today's speakers. Before we get started, I wanted to mention that you can submit your questions for the speakers right in the chat thread for this event. Okay, and with that, let's get started. Joining us today is Alex Kirk with Corelight. Alex, would you like to introduce yourself? Certainly. Hi. Um, I am currently the manager of the Global Security Consultant Group at Corelight. I've been in uh, InfoSec with an open source twist for the last 18 years, uh, including time at Sourcefire, Cisco, and Tenable before coming to Corelight. Thanks for joining us, Alex. Also joining us today is Omer Singer. Omer, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Omer Singer. I lead cybersecurity strategy at Snowflake. been with the company for over four years, initially led security engineering at Snowflake. And now I'm helping our customers use Snowflake as a security data lake. Great. Welcome to the conversation. And lastly, Joe Buchanan with Hunters. Hi, I'm Joe Buchanan, VP of Sales Engineering at Hunters. So I've got about 20 years of uh, experience working in both operational roles, uh, large organizations, uh, with a real focus on net network detection and response and basically trying to find the weird that's uh, inside the network and making it relevant or help help combat some of these uh, modern day threats. So excited to be here. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Great to have you. The reason we wanted to host this session is increasingly we are meeting with security leaders and practitioners that have frustrations with their SIM. Either they see problems on the data logging side, depending on the SIM they are using, they may have limitations in terms of scale or cost, or when it comes to getting security value out of their SIM, many organizations are frustrated around the time and effort it takes to build out rules, cross-correlate, and investigate incidents using a SIM. Alex, can you kick us off by sharing some of the challenges you are seeing? Certainly. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to actually uh, kick off with a bit of a visual about what modern SIMs typically look like. Um, you're gonna have a whole variety of different data sources that are coming in from application servers to network devices to security devices. Uh, and the hard part about all these disparate data sources is that they're coming in from different vendors and different formats with no sort of inherent concept of normalization um, or, or any sort of linkage between them. And a lot of organizations have sort of felt like, well, if I can just get this data all in one central place, then I'll be able to make something useful out of it. And the problem is that they end up in a scenario that is closer to what you're seeing on screen here, where there's a bunch of sort of mismatched pieces of data that don't necessarily cover everything that you need from a security perspective, um, that are often redundant against each other, leading to sort of large ingest issues. Um, as well as just, you know, it's challenging to maintain this many connections uh, from a logging perspective in good health. Uh, and it's entirely too easy to have, you know, points of failure, whether they be, you know, machine-based or even human error, where, you know, perhaps a firewall admin has turned down logging to save CPU on an overburdened device and created a, a visibility blind spot uh, in the process. And so it's a, a difficult sort of a landscape that people are trying to operate under and they're spending a lot more time transforming data than actually using that data for any kind of real analytics. Um, and so to, to solve that problem, fundamentally what we talk about at Corelight is having a, a data strategy um, that really focuses on what you need in order to be able to operationalize things in the SOC. Um, and I reference actually a pyramid of SOC capabilities from a chief security architect over at Microsoft, um, but I think there's a great job of putting this into perspective. Um, fundamentally, you're going to need to start out with some sort of inventory of devices on your network. You, you're never gonna be able to protect things that you don't know about. Um, and you're gonna need to be able to see what those devices are actually doing uh, with each other in order to understand when you get some sort of a detection, um, is that detection actually valid or is it some sort of a false positive? Um, and in the cases where something is legitimate and you, you need to triage and understand the scope of how bad things are, having easy access back into that telemetry and understanding of the devices that are impacted uh, is really going to <clears throat> speed the process of being able to do something useful with these alerts. Um, and you know, fundamentally, any alerting platform um, without that underlying data is going to produce more sort of noise than it is signal at the end of the day. 
Um, now, <clears throat> if you're talking about you know, how to actually operationalize this in the real world. Um, one of the big questions that folks have up front is whether or not you want to go with a SaaS service um, to do your, your data collection and analytics. Um, and obviously data volume is one of the biggest reasons out there to go with the cloud. Um, <clears throat> you know, modern networks are continuing to expand in size and scope. Um, and it's often challenging to have the hardware or the on-premise licensing to be able to ingest all the data that's necessary to get a complete security picture of your environment. Um, and so, you know, functionally, it's a very good idea to have that scale and storage up in the cloud to go to. Um, a lot of the reason that folks aren't going to the cloud typically that we see these days revolves around regulation, um, typically on the government side, waiting for FIP certification or GovCloud or so, something like that. Um, but really it's, it's less operational and more rules-based uh, reasons why people might not go to the cloud. The, you know, the big key in all of this and, and what's particularly true with the, the Hunter solution is that in that cloud sort of environment, the vendor is the one who's going to be doing all that normalization of all those different data sources and bringing that sort of incoherent mess into a much clearer, crisper picture. Um, and so there's a lot of value to be had in, in bringing that to someone uh, who's going to do a lot of that normalization for you and allow you to get more directly into the analytics at the end of the day. Um, <clears throat> so to just sort of level set about what kind of data we're going to want in an analytics solution up in the cloud like this, uh, everyone agrees that you need to have EDR as, as a, a foundational part of an analytics or XDR solution. Um, partially because the depth of visibility that it provides is really unparalleled. You're, you're able to see what processes were spawned, what files were touched, uh, perhaps the identity of the end user. Um, there's just a wealth of great forensic data that is gonna come off of the endpoint. Um, the hard part about it, of course, is breadth. Uh, because yes, you may have an EDR solution even on Windows servers, for example, certainly in Windows desktops, uh, but you're never gonna have it on your SolarWinds device, for example, or your IoT systems or any of a number of other kind of unmanaged devices. Um, not to mention the reality that skilled attackers can actually disable or tamper with EDR in a system that they control. Um, so while Endpoint is a great starting point, um, you need to really add a network to that mix as well. Um, the hard part these days is the question of, you know, which network are you talking about? Because while everything must cross some sort of a network in order to be relevant as, you know, a, a potential security incident, it's a question of, you know, did a piece of malware hit a sales guy's laptop from a hotel Wi-Fi network. It's kind of like the classic, you know, if a tree fell in the forest and, and no one was there to hear it, um, did it really fall? Uh, the reality in security, of course, is yes, that that incident definitely occurred, um, but nobody was able to respond to it if they lacked that visibility. Um, and really the combination of network and endpoint together is going to give you um, that sort of balance of coverage uh, because places that typically have the lowest levels of EDR installation have the best chance of being easy to tap for network detection and response. Uh, whether that's server farms where you're able to do decryption on inbound flows and, and gain visibility at the network level, um, IoT installations, or really kind of the crown jewels inside of your corporate environment like Active Directory servers, um, RDP and VPN head ends, point of sale terminals, all of those things are gonna be fixed in place and thus very easy to tap at the network level. Um, and things that you know, are roaming and typically are difficult to tap from a network perspective um, have the highest coverage from an EDR perspective, whether those be workstations or mobile devices. Um, now, of course, you'll also need to, to worry about the cloud as we move beyond traditional on-premise networks and, and into you know, the hybrid environments that so many organizations have today. Um, the hard part about cloud visibility, of course, is that while it's necessary, it's a complex sort of situation to deal with because at the end of the day, um, the cloud really is just someone else's data center. Um, and so that means that you're in situations like, for example, Microsoft Azure um, has been promising a virtual tap for the entirety of the last two years. Uh, but has been unable to deliver on that. And so you're uh, <clears throat> forced to go with endpoint solutions for network visibility in that environment. Um, it's common too, even in cloud environments that do have VTAPs and, and network level visibility to have <clears throat> infrastructure such that you're not 
getting visibility from traditional security devices. Um, you know, a classic example is in cloud service delivery models, things are pushed towards the edge of a distributed architecture and don't go back through a central firewall for any sort of monitoring, unless it's, it's super important to make sure that you've got tapping in place to check all of these things. Um, not to mention, of course, all of the different cloud services uh, that are entirely outside of your control uh, as, as a network monitoring organization, um, you know, and, and thus the need for things like CASB that are going to allow you uh, to have some visibility into what your users are doing on those cloud services. Um, kind of wrapping up the picture of what, you know, fundamental data sources you're going to need to do security well uh, is identity and access management. Um, now, the reality, of course, is that you need to be doing multi-factor authentication anyway as the security best practice. Uh, Microsoft has actually put statistics around this that say you're 99% less likely to get compromised if you have 2FA involved. Um, and because you know, multi-factor and identity uh, access management cover so many of those scenarios where your, your actors are on devices that are unmanaged connecting to services that you don't have visibility into, um, having that sort of logging and identity management from these services uh, is going to, you know, really help you cover those blind spots and get the broader picture of what you need to, to understand about your user's activity, uh, as well as, of course, helping you prioritize alerts based upon the impact of identity. Obviously, your SOC is going to scramble a lot harder uh, if you've got a successful phishing attack against the CEO, for example, than a common garden variety piece of malware being dropped on an administrative assistance uh, system. But, you know, fundamentally, the, the key piece that I think is the most important is, you know, with all of these different data sources, you need to be able to link them together intelligently, and you need to be able to link the detections that come out of these data sources back into that telemetry. Because, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if it's a human or a machine going through an alert and trying to validate it to, to figure out if it needs to be highlighted. Um, they're going to need the telemetry around it in order to validate the truth of the alert and the impact that it delivers at the end of the day. Um, you know, some common examples of this uh, is for Sunburst, um, your organization might have generated DNS lookups to the AVSVM cloud domain that was at the heart of the command and control there, um, but it was a question of what answers were returned, whether or not you went to second stage malware or your, your <clears throat> infection was kill switched and your organization never got hit harder. Um, you'll have, you know, typically thousands of log4j exploit attempts coming in per day across uh, data centers that you control, but whether or not Java was actually downloaded by one of the machines being targeted is that question you need to answer to determine if you need to move into the next stage of things. Um, you know, this applies equally well for classic attacks like SQL injection um, that will run across an entire data center, generate thousands of alerts. Uh, and again, if those all come back 404s, then it's easy uh, for your algorithm or your human analyst to move along and go to the things that actually matter uh, as opposed to just so much noise on the internet. Um, and really, if you're able to quickly go from these detections into the telemetry that surrounds them, um, it's going to allow you um, to really kind of outmaneuver the attackers that are coming after you out there today. Um, you know, the reality that we all face as network defenders is that attackers are going to be maneuvering across network space and time in pursuit of what's often a, a very well-defined set of goals. Um, and because defenders have had that disjointedness between all of their different data sources um, and that inability to actually move between those detections and the underlying telemetry clearly, um, they've only been able to cover sort of a smaller subset of this maneuver space that they're working with. Um, and by making strategic investments and in kind of fundamental tool sets people and processes, um, you're going to be able to expand the area that you can effectively cover um, by being able to move rapidly enough um, and see things uh, in advance far enough to be able to actually catch advanced attackers as they move across your enterprise. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and now turn it on over to Joe to talk specifically about how the combination of Corelight, Huntress, and Snowflake can help you achieve that goal of outmaneuvering attackers. All right, thank, thank you, Alex. So yeah, let me let me jump into, Alex did a really good job on uh, defining the problem statement and what we're all up against to help, you know, not, not only combat some of the threats that have been around for a while, but a lot of the uh, a lot of the new threats, just 
all of the other areas that uh, threat vectors can get in. So let me actually talk a little bit about uh, Hunters and how it's helping uh, build a new SOC platform to make operational teams life a lot easier. Instead of chasing tech and investigating one feed at a time on threat vectors, how do we bring all that information together but also add some of the simplicity to, um, uh, to allow this to actually be built for your organization? You know, one of the problems I've seen over the years is, you know, deploying new technologies to help combat threats. But a lot of times when you deploy those on premise, you also had to figure out disk, uh, compute, you know, do I have enough processing power to not only um, investigate these threats, but store these threats to be able to look back in time. Because a, a threat that might emerge today may have actually been planted uh, months ago with, within your environment. So this is one of the great things about Hunters being uh, SaaS born and actually partnering with Snowflake and using the uh, elasticity of cloud and being able to store essentially unlimited uh, telemetry. And the way we actually have built this is not to penalize on ingestion. So we wanna take as much, as much ingest as possible so that you have all of the context to be able to detect some of the modern threats. So I'll go through some examples of exactly what this looks like, but let me turn it over to Omar, uh, uh, Omar first to go into Snowflake and give a little bit of an overview here. Yeah, th thanks Joe. So Alex mentioned this concept of the extensive maneuver space that the SOC needs, and, and you talked about how the SOC needs seamless unlimited data capability. Um, let's kind of pop the hood on, on what's behind that and, and look to see what Snowflake Data Cloud brings to the SOC. Um, as the security data lake. And, and here we see the, the three layers of Snowflake Data Cloud, all of which runs on all three of the major clouds. And um, at its core is the centralized storage, uh, which is uh, both cost-effective and virtually limitless. And so as telemetry from the network and from the endpoints and from everywhere else is collected, uh, it is compressed, partitioned, and stored in uh, cloud storage uh, such that it, it never runs out, it's always hot, and um, really um, no, no need to limit the, the daily ingest or the retention. Uh, but the data cloud is more than just a storage solution. That's where we see the second layer is that separate compute layer, separate from the storage, which is always available. Um, when a query is issued, for example, as part of incident response, as part of detection, virtually unlimited compute resources are available. Uh, but when the investigation wraps up or the threat hunting team goes home for the day, uh, those compute resources are, are automatically kind of powered down and uh, that unlocks a lot of the cost savings of this model, really taking advantage of the elasticity of the cloud. And this is all delivered as a service. And that's the third layer that we see here where customers are operating Snowflake as a security data lake at petabyte scale with virtually no management overhead also benefiting from uh, very powerful governance capabilities. And that's allowing even uh, very sensitive and, and highly regulated organizations to take advantage of all the benefits of this data platform. Next slide, let's see how it kind of fits in to that um, modern SOC. And, and we see Snowflake as that kind of uh, bottom layer here, the security data lake where data can be piped in directly uh, but really, uh, the connected app ecosystem is what supports operationalizing this data platform. And so with Hunters running on top of Snowflake, all the kind of uh, data collectors are available off the shelf. The enrichment, the normalization, the detection is all provided by the connected application. And then um, the team can, can access the data through the connected application or directly within Snowflake for ad hoc analytics. Uh, but let's see more of that. So Joe, back over to you. All right, perfect, thank you. Yeah, and Alex actually called it out with the problem statement of all the various uh, feeds and trying to normalize so that you can actually make sense of that data to figure out how to use it. So the first key piece that Hunters is gonna provide with uh, Snowflake is ingesting all those various data sources. And Omer actually called it out, we are keeping this in hot storage. So all those data feeds from core light to endpoint to email, uh, to cloud in anywhere that can log uh, security context of threats and or visibility. 
including things like uh, threat feeds or information that you know about your assets. So from um, uh, uh, change management databases or anywhere that you have tagged information that can be uh, fed into this pipeline. The first thing that Unders is going to do is take all of that disparate telemetry, normalize it, write it into a common schema, and then put that into a Snowflake database that, that you would own. So uh, at any point, you can go back and have full control of that database. But first, you know, let me just kind of emphasize the simplicity inside of Hunters as far as going in and being able to add additional data sources. So th this is the uh, data sources uh, screen that as you kind of discover what your environment looks like and where you need to get that visibility, you, know, you could see things like core light listed in here. So it, as Alex called out, there's going to be segments in most environments that are gonna have unpatched machines. They're gonna have uh, machines that don't have endpoint on it. And it could be just machines that are being used to uh, you know, even run security cameras or uh, in manufacturing, running, uh, uh, running some of the equipment. So there, there's always going to be these, uh, I'll just call it weakest links. It's going to be assets, things, people uh, that are going to be uh, scattered throughout your infrastructure that you need to have uh, contextual visibility throughout. So anywhere that you can get that insight, you can feed that directly inside of the Hunter's platform. Uh, it'll write it out first and foremost. So you have access to all of that evidence uh, for long-term storage. But the important thing that Hunters is going to provide is not making you go through and look at each individual threat uh, singularly. It's actually going to send it through a uh, threat detection pipeline or engine. So the, the first thing is to take and normalize all that data, uh, start to pull out leads or things of interest that come in from uh, native detectors like Corelight or uh, CrowdStrike or various endpoint detectors. But through Hunter's uh, threat research team, they will also write additional detectors that may not come natively um, uh, from some of these sources, and they will add additional uh, threat detections on top of this. Now, once we have that, they'll do automatic uh, scoring. So taking the scoring that comes natively from uh, various uh, signals or, or threats, but taking that and sending it through additional scoring engines to just basically let you know a high, medium, and low of all of these leads. What do I actually need to investigate? And then you know, tying into uh, other operational tools you might have like SOAR platforms to be able to automatically respond to these type of threats. So let, let's walk through briefly exactly what this looks like. So we are actually logged in here to the um, uh, Hunter's platform and across the top, you will actually see all of the ingest sources that you might have within, within your infrastructure. It could be Corelight, uh, it could be AWS, it could be CrowdStrike, you know, name your source. Those are basically where we get the signals from. We will write all of that raw data out into the Snowflake uh, database, which allows you that, that cloud storage and elasticity. So you, you basically have unlimited storage to be able to store the information that you need to re uh, be able to respond to threats. Now, one, once we have that telemetry, we are gonna start to go through it and pull out leads. Uh, leads are the interesting things that you might need to investigate on a day-to-day on -day basis. But through the scoring process and the cross-correlation and the automation that's built within, we will pull out uh, hot leads. And hot leads are those things where if you don't have um, if you have to take care of you know one thing on a given day, it's the hot leads that are extracted that with very high confidence, these are the things that you actually need to investigate, uh, followed by hot stories, which is going to add a, a graphing model and uh, cross correlation and aut uh, automation. And I'm going to show you an example of that here in a second, but to automate that whole process from a security operations center's workflow perspective. So going a little bit further and taking uh, Corelight as an example, um, Corelight being one example of uh, uh, where we can gain the evidence to help do threat detection. And what we're looking at here was, is actually the recent um, F5 vulnerability that came out. Uh, the threat research team with Axon um, inside of Hunters is constantly looking for the new emerging threat, the things that we don't know about or trying to figure out you know, how do we combat these threats that are gonna, gonna show up tomorrow? 
So they have, on the back end, they have um, identified where this uh, uh, vulnerability actually exists, and we'll do IOC sweeps against all customer environments. And what's listed here is the actual evidence that came out from um, uh, Corelight to quickly show the who, what, when, where of where a threat emerged. Um, now you would also have full access to this information and there's gonna be you know, custom IOC sweeps or investigations that you as an organization wanna run and you have full, full reign to be able to run that against the database. Whereas Team Axon will also work on your behalf uh, to be able to constantly do sweeps and pull out threats that may emerge inside your environment. So flipping into a little bit more of how the response is uh, automated, what we're looking at on the right is an automated, uh, automated cross-correlation or story as we call it. So taking in, if you look at each row, this is the signals that could come in from individual uh, solutions. It might be an email solution, uh, it could be network such as with Corelight, uh, you as a SOC, SOC operator may not investigate each one of these um, threats individually, but when they come into the Hunter's platform, we will automatically cross-correlate and make those individual signals a lot more relevant. And in this scenario, um, it could have been an account compromise that actually came in through an email threat vector, um, or it could have just been came in from an, an insider threat, somebody's uh, credentials that were stolen, and they were able to gain access to a, a device inside the network. So by taking that information and seeing the next layer of detection that, that may be through a, a cloud or it may be through identity, <clears throat> being able to uh, cross correlate it all the way to a potential uh, data exfiltration within, within the environment as, as what's calling out here. So the, the value with hunters is to take all those disparate sources, cross correlate it, operationalize it and then graph it out to make it a lot easier for the SOC operators to be able to uh, respond to that threat. Uh, taking it just another layer, the Hunter's platform also has overlays with the MITRE ATT&CK framework. So th this is basically letting you know from all of these various uh, ingest sources, how much coverage do you have against the MITRE ATT&CK framework? And if you go further into your environment and you may have uh, Corelight or some other data source, and you wanna know, does this add value to the threat detection? Simply going into that um, MITRE framework, clicking onto that ingest source, this will automatically overlay, is this gonna increase your uh, detection inside your environment? So this is one of the other um, automated pieces that's built within the Hunter's platform. And just a, a few other pieces, and I think the importance is, you know, for operational teams, instead of looking at uh, just tables, it's how do we how do we visualize and amplify, you know, those threat signals that we get from uh, from various sources. So what we're looking at here is just taking it a little bit further and actually showing the um, graph correlation uh, automated, so that you truly understand. Uh, the full attack uh, story. All right, so rounding it off, while it's important to have these signals from various uh, detections and en engines like uh, Corelight, like email, uh, like endpoint detection, looking at each one of them individually may be challenging for operators. And the power of, of hunters that's coming in is taking all of those disparate uh, tools, reducing the noise, uh, and helping amplify that telemetry so that you actually know exactly where the threat is and uh, contextualizing all, all that information for you. So in, in summary, this is um, the, what customers are looking for is automated actions onto where the threat actually exists, really saving time for the security team so that it can empower them to figure out what do they actually need to investigate to minimize the security risk but to automate, bring all that contextual data together. And in summary, uh, it's critical for organizations because it's really the weakest link is where the major threat can actually come into an environment. So making sure that you have comprehensive visibility throughout the entire uh, 
threat landscape from endpoint to cloud to network uh, to email to identity, being able to pull all of that in, store it for long-term retention, but also using an automated solution to be able to reduce the noise and help you as a operational team figure out what do you need to focus on first. So as far as a call to action, if you would like a deeper dive uh, demo or would like to kick off a proof of concept, you can reach uh, the Hunter sales team at sales at hunters.ai, uh, but also drill in for additional information to see, uh, uh, to be able to access through the AWS marketplace. And you can also contact the Corelight team if you would like to get additional network detection response inside your environment. And on that, I thank you for uh, attending. Great. Thanks, Joe. Great recap. That concludes our presentation for today. We had some great questions coming in and we'll continue to answer them even after the close of the event. Also, please feel free to reach out to the contacts we've shared with any additional questions for our speakers. Thanks for joining us.